Good evening and welcome to the One Book, One Minnesota statewide book club event on A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, featuring Sun Young Shin, editor, and contributors Tyon Coleman, Shannon Gibney, David Lawrence Grant, Carolyn Holbrook, Ebay, and Andrea Jenkins. The One Book, One Minnesota program is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book in partnership with State Library Services. I'm Elaine Hopkins, Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. As such, we present programming that reaches all corners of our state and promotes reading, libraries, and our state's literary legacy. As we get started this evening, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which we broadcast tonight. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also want to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota. And we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. We created the One Book, One Minnesota with a network of libraries and educational organizations in April to bring Minnesotans together during a time of adversity and highlight the role of libraries in our communities. The desire to bring people together to connect through stories became even more important after Minneapolis policemen murdered George Floyd in May. Library patrons and community members all over the state have been reading and discussing a good time for the truth, race in Minnesota. And hopefully we are all inspired by the beautiful, thoughtful and painful essays in this book to take action against racism, both structural and individual. The ebook of A Good Time for the Truth is available for free to download through Sunday, August 23rd. And you can still visit thefriends.org slash one book for that link and additional resources. There have been nearly 20,000 views of the anthology since this second chapter of One Book, One Minnesota has begun. You can purchase hard copies of A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, which you absolutely should do because it's the kind of book you will find yourself coming back to again and again. Uh, you can purchase those from many local independent bookstores and through the Minnesota Historical Society Press. We're going to hear from an amazing group of writers tonight, and their bios will be shared in the chat as a PDF. We'd like to give a special shout out to Carolyn Holbrook, whose book of essays, Tell Me Your Names and I Will Testify, has just been released by University of Minnesota Press. We'll include these links and more in the chat throughout the evening. I'd like to thank our partners, the Council of Regional Public Library Systems Administrators, Minitex, a joint program of the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, the Minnesota Department of Education, and Minnesota Historical Society Press. This program is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Center for the Book through the Minnesota Department of Education. We want to hear how this program has affected you, so please be on the lookout for a brief questionnaire and also a link to the recording of today's events in the coming days. This evening's program is being captioned by Christy Arntzen from Paradigm Captioning, so thank you very much, Christy. You can toggle the captions on or off and adjust the appearance from the menu bar. And after we hear from all the panelists, we'll open it up for a question and answer session and we will get to as many of your questions as time allows. So please feel free to share those questions in the chat. Thank you all so much for being part of the event today. And now I would like to introduce Sun Young Shin, editor of A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, and author of poetry collections, Unbearable Splendor, a finalist for the 2017 Penn USA Literary Award for Poetry and winner of the 2016 Minnesota Book Award for Poetry, Rough and Savage and Skirt Full of Black, winner of the 2007 Asian American Literary Award for Poetry. She's co-editor of Outsiders Within, writing on transracial adoption and author of the bilingual illustrated children's book, Cooper's Lesson. She lives in Minneapolis, where she co-directs the community organization Poetry Asylum with poet Su Wong. Welcome, Sun Young. Thank you for putting this incredible book together and for being with us tonight. 
Thank you, Elaine, and thank you to David and Wendy and everyone at the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library and to Christy Arntzen, who is our intrepid captioner tonight. So there's instructions on how to access the captions in the chat if that's something you want to do. Um, thank you everyone for being here, all 376 and counting of you. It's really wonderful to be together, even if it's remotely, so that we can talk about the most urgent issues facing our community and our world. Uh, I did see that our books editor, Ann Regan from the Minnesota Historical Society Press is here. So um, if I make any mistakes, we could just, you know, we could blame them on, on Anne. She's the one who gave me an opportunity to work with the press to bring this book to life back in 2016. So we are here because um, there's a lot of work to be done. And so I'm not going to say um, any more because I want to give um, as much time as possible to my colleagues who, as you know, are amazing. So with that, I just want to say thank you to Andrea Jenkins, Tyon Coleman, eBay, Shannon Gibney, David Lawrence Grant, and Carolyn Holbrook. They will be speaking in that order. And I also want to, this is my prop of Carolyn's new book. Please check it out. Some of you I'm sure were also at her launch last week. It's gorgeous. It's well-earned. Please support it. You will be um, richly rewarded. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Andrea Jenkins. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, what an honor to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you to the Minnesota Historical Society Press for um, for publishing this work and putting this event together, the, the St. Paul Public Libraries and um, just all the partners that have been in, involved in this. But, but most of all, I want to just say thank you to to all of the contributors and all of my colleagues and dear, dear friends. I, I was just thinking about the lineup tonight and, and each and every one of us has a very long history together that is um, interwoven by personal relationship, but writing and, and a deep connection to, to writing. We, we've all been in, in several workshops together and other anthologies and, and just building community together uh, around literature. And so this is one more step in this process. Um, it's really, um, uh, I think, encouraging when, when your work can be um, revived to, to deal with um, a specific moment in history. Um, and so um, I think it, it really is um, just um, worthy of remarking that, that all of us have written words that can help us speak to what this, this unprecedented moment is. And before I read a page from my, um, from my essay and then you know, follow up with a few more remarks, um, I just want to say congratulations to to all of um, all of my my co panelists tonight who have just been uh, receiving all kinds of accolades and and publishing opportunities and um, really um, contributing to to Minnesota's rich literary history, but also contributing to what I think is um, uh, bringing more justice and more um, more equality and equity to our world. So the first page that I opened up in my essay is the page that I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, I really love this this entire book. The title of my essay is called "The Price We Pay." And I opened it up to page 166. 
Nichols. This is the historical trauma that I carry with me on a daily basis. I can interact with white people because I understand that it is not the individual, but rather the system of white supremacy that continues to hold us back. The thing is, however, that systems are created, perpetrated, and sustained by individuals. And there are people who benefit from this centuries long upside down reality that renders black folks victims of the continual plundering perpetrated by this system. And only people can work to overcome these inequities in our society. I suppose that other contributors to this dialogue can tell you that Black people pay more for cars and houses than the broader population. There's documentation that in Black communities, the food at the grocery store costs more and is of lesser quality than the food offered in the suburbs. And that is if there is a grocery store in your neighborhood. All you have to do is turn on the television to find that Black, that being Black can cost you your life, especially for Black men. Check for Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Eric Harris, or Eric Garner, who was killed by a New York City police officer while pleading for his life on video, saying, I can't breathe. Sound familiar? Blacks in America are the only group of people that have been violently, legislatively, and legally disaffected by the very system that we built. Yet we continue to pay our fair share of taxes and contributions we Black Americans continue to move this grand experiment called America closer to being one of the best models of democracy in the world. But this country also fears Black America. Non-Blacks worry that if we actually had equal opportunity in this society, that we Black Americans might just achieve more than they could imagine. They fear that we might begin to do the things to them that have been done to us. I don't know how that would actually play out, but I do know it needs to happen. If you get this far in this essay, you'll know that I, a Black, American trans woman started out with a significant deficit in life and suffered many losses and indignities along the way. I have come to understand that because of transphobia and racism, I will only get so far in life. I am only expected to achieve so much. It takes every ounce of strength I have to get up and face the world every day. Real talk. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we're, we're faced with this same scenario. I can't breathe. Um, only this time is George Floyd and, you know, Breonna Taylor, who, who was in her bedroom at night, uh, an essential worker gunned down by the police, um, Ahmaud Arbery. And so, you know, we got to keep telling the truth. We got to keep fighting for justice. Um, you know, I, I was reading that essay and thinking, wow, 
I, I achieved being the vice president of the Minneapolis City Council. Um, and um, it, 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 it still is a deep honor. It's a very challenging role to be in right now. Um, but I actually get the opportunity to try to help move some justice forward. But the only way that that's going to happen is if we have full cooperation from everybody. And, you know, if, if people want justice for jo George Floyd, what that really means is that's justice for Black people. And, and that's the work that we have to do. And that's the work that I am um, challenging all of you to help me do. Thank you, everybody. And our next um, um, author uh, is, is my dear friend, my homegirl, um, Professor Extraordinaire. Every time I'm on a, on a panel with her or I hear her voice on the radio, I am just so inspired. And that is Tayan Coleman. Thank you, Andrea. Love you back, Southside. Um, good evening, everybody. I just want to thank um, Andrea, um, and she's right, and I echo her gratitude and thank you to all of you. Um, yeah, it, it seems like, wow, 20 something years has gone by uh, so fast, and here we are. Um, we're supposed to talk about what we're working on, so I can say that I'm writing poems that are memorializing victims of COVID. And those poems are appearing on the Tupelo Press website as part of the 3030 project. Today, I posted my 20th poem and I have 10 more to go. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about my essay, but I'm gonna read one of my poems because there's a connection. Um, my essay is called Disparate Impacts and I use uh, humor and you know, Sometimes those things that are dark are quite humorous, but I write about um, structural racism uh, in education. And in that essay, I talk about uh, Confederate flags. And of course, a uh, Confederate flag is a symbol, but it's a symbol that represents an ideology. Ideally, uh, thinking about George Floyd and what has happened since, it's almost as if that ideology is up close and front. And how do we look at the very specific ways within various institutions, within our individual lives uh, and experiences that the ideology of that symbol of the Confederate flag rears itself in our very um, bodies. And COVID is a result of that. I think I checked today in Minnesota, if you are a Black American, you are over four times as likely to die um, from COVID. So literally, um, it, is, it is killing us. So my essay, um, Disparate Impacts Living Just Enough for the City, the last line reads on page 42, there are Confederate flags everywhere, even in places where we can't see them. And thinking about when I wrote that, um, this notion between what's visible and what's invisible, where now so much of what people thought was invisible um, is visible. And there are those of us who could, have always been able to see it, but in some sense, it's now being laid bare for the world to see. And um, my hope is that we hold each other and we don't uh, look away. And in some sense, I think in our very own individual ways, that's what we write about. So I'm gonna read you a poem um, that I wrote uh, and it's titled, You Are Great in Your Own Right. And it's dedicated to Principal Des Ann Romain. And she was an immigrant from the West Indies and she came to the United States, uh, came to New York and she very, had a very hard time like many uh, kids of color in the public school system. Um, but she overcame those challenges of, of institutional and structural racism and she went on to become an educator and she was that teacher that saved lives. Uh, and I too am a teacher, I'm first generation college educated, originally from Chicago, from uh, the Tintray. Um, and her experience spoke to me, um, but she was the person who literally saved students uh, from the edge and told them how great they really are. And oftentimes the structural racism, right? That Confederate flag ideology, we, we are told that we're not great. We're, we are told that we are not smarter, that we're not capable and that we embody that. And in some sense, she was the angel that came and said, no, you are smart, don't believe those things. Um, she died from COVID at age 36. Um, so, you are great in your own right, Principal Des Anne Romaine. 
you're not college material, my high school counselor said, and lucky for me at 17, self-defense was my default stance. Set on survival, I really wasn't present enough to fully understand what her verdict meant. Y'all know what I'm talking about. How many times did someone tell you or treat you like you were never gonna be somebody, like you were out of your mind, like you were already messed up and you messed your shit up, like it was not gonna happen for someone like you, like you weren't gonna make it out, like you couldn't come back from that, like you was never gonna to amount to nothing. I guess this is what happens when we are forced to live in a world where there are only fake choices between two false things. And thank the Lord that God protects babies and fools. Which one are you? The Wizard of Oz is my favorite movie, so I foolishly believe that I could always make it because there was no other choice. As an oppressed black Southside Chicago girl, my story inherently came with tornadoes, burning brooms, dying mothers, broken homes, lying ringmasters, camouflage witches, broken loyal friends, winding trails, flying monkeys, and privileged white people living in gated cities of gold. Rosemary Olds drove a red Pontiac Fiero. She was that good witch that walked into my composition class with a cane from her then recent diagnosis of MS. She was the first teacher to tell me that I could write. I thought she was smoking crack too, y'all. Me, a good writer? I looked at the A she scribbled on my handwritten paper. Yes, I can see you. You are a good writer, she said. You must first tell your own story before you can understand or tell others because your story is equally as important. Old magic was that simple. Truth, love, respect, and humanity. Looking and seeing. After that day, I believed and was released from the binding words of my high school counselor. So who words held you or are binding you? Think about it. They say hurt people hurt people. And I say that hurt people healed and healing make good teachers. Long after Olds, I thought to send my high school counselor a copy of each degree I earned, but I never did. I guess I didn't want to give her or myself the satisfaction of admitting how powerful her limiting words had been in my life. I didn't want to give her any of my magic. I say good teachers heal people. There's no place like home. There's no one like you. You are so special. You are your home. Thank you. And eBay is next. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? I hope we all doing well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to everyone who's been part of this book. It's been an absolute honor to be part of the book and all the panel discussions we, uh, we've been having over the years. And, uh, you know, I hope that um, you all out there in the ether uh, I don't know who's all looking at me, but I hope uh, if this is your first search panel for this book or your just the next one, I hope uh, you are able to take even a single nugget that you can take with you and, and try to put into practice because that's what um, this project is all about. It's we're trying to change something very big, but knowing that no big change comes about, but gradual. Um, Every little change leads to that. Uh, nothing is impossible, no matter how big, without if you go at it uh, little by little. This is in our own little way trying to add to that big change that we all need. Um, not only in America, I think in the world. You know, what America suffers from to a certain degree, it's uh, present all over the world. So, my name again is eBay. Um, from Guinea and Sierra Leone, just a couple of days ago, I celebrated my 44th birthday. Out of that, I've been here for uh, close to 30 years. 
So uh, my essay, Trouble in Mind, is a lot about that home, trying to find home in the uh, in my case, you know, when I wrote this, this was a few years ago, but I still had been here for way much longer than I was in Guinea or Sierra Leone. So just trying to, you know, meditate over that a little bit, um, trying to answer for myself and hopefully that says something about America in the process. Oh, where should I start? I think I'll start I'm reading a book right now called um, Searching for Zion by Emily Roboto. I'm not good with name, but I think so. And um, I was just reading it in a plane. And there's a section about uh, where she visits Israel and just talking uh, to the Falasha people there call I guess she said and I didn't know this before that they actually don't like to be called flasher and but I have the other <laughs> name used I have issues with that which is better Israel you know but uh, I think there's more to read than I know now but um, one of the activists she met there she was talking to and he I think he had written an essay and we just the essay was a very a uh, hard look at being black in Israel. And um, he talked about his journey from um, Ethiopia to Sudan to eventually getting uh, quote unquote rescued, right, uh, to Israel, I think back in 1985. And, but he finished basically a dream deferred for the, uh, for the better Israel, Israelites of uh, Israel being that, uh, they spent all their life, even before birth, over generations, yearning for this Jerusalem, you know, uh, this promised land, so to speak, and to come there and see it, you know, not that, that um, if even if not quite just like Ethiopia, but has its problems that are just as hard as maybe as Ethiopia. So speaking uh, about this, the, uh, it's a memoir, the book is a memoir. So the uh, author made a comment that uh, it sounds like you love it here. Just the passion that he expressed about no matter all of that, no matter that he's been let down uh, by Israel, he still loves it there. So he came back saying, of course, I love it in Jerusalem, but I tell the truth. And I say that because um, in the essay and a lot of, I'm also a poet in a lot of my poems I write, they can be very critical of the United States. But I think it's all rooted in love for this place. And um, I don't have to, uh, you only have to know who I am, the fact that, you know, I'm an African to know that because perhaps unlike some people, my privilege is that I have a choice. I can uh, be here or not be here, you know. But the flip side to that is, so the, uh, over my, over uh, the 30 years or so that I've been, I've been, not also almost 30 years that I've been here, I've been very uh, curious and uh, fascinated with this country of mine. Now I can say that. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And it started first, almost like my first week here, because, um, before coming here, the history I was taught uh, was half of the story, so to speak, um, that led me to believe that there were no blacks in America, in that only black immigrants like myself, there were no African Americans, so to speak, you know, because when slavery ended, the British returned all the slaves back to places like Liberia and Sierra Leone. And uh, that was that. Then we focus on colonization a little bit. Uh, so 
it was not until um, I came here that first week, I went to McDonald's and saw all these black people. And I remember my cousin and I just trying to place them as far as ethnic groups back in Sierra Leone and Guinea or such and such look like this, they must be that. And uh, actually I approached a couple of gentlemen and uh, spoke language to them because they just look like they could be Mandingos, you know? And um, surprisingly enough, uh, I guess to us, they were not. And found that at that point, I started, you know, reading and uh, because went a couple of months later, started attending school and learned that, in fact, you know, Eddie Murphy was not an African immigrant as we thought when we saw him in the movies, you know. So I've always been fascinated by, by that, by the place of African in, uh, in, this, in this country. Um, for being here as long as black people have been here and to be so denied full citizenship you know it's fascinated me that for 100 years after slavery that the system was able was still been able to maintain that to a large degree When Sun Young approached me to write uh, uh, an essay for this book, she, uh, I think, suggested or just wanted me to look at a Stranger uh, in a Village by James Baldwin. And uh, remember reading that just the feeling of isolation he felt in a small village in Europe, he was able to relate that to um, being Black in America. And I thought that's so sad and so wrong that a, somebody who's been in the country for generations and generations and generations, you know, can feel as a black person in a small village in Europe, because we all know what that, uh, what that means. And America's tried to perpetrate that over and over, and it's always fascinated me so i've always been interested in now uh, you know the african-american history in this country anyway okay let me read i think i'm rambling on too long <laughs> uh this section of my essay uh that i'm reading is really trying to think about a little bit uh the differences between being black in america and uh, being black where I came from in a small town in Sierra Leone. Before moving to America, I did not see the world through a black lens. Quendu, that small town in Eastern Sierra Leone was all black. In other words, was not black, just like Kanka in many parts of Africa. We are doctors, teachers, wealthy men. Indeed, we had successful men of all stripes. We did not have black doctors, black businessmen, or any so-called role models. We had people doing things we children knew we could just as easily do when we grew up. The town had a few drunkards. We laughed, teased, and threw stones at them as they stumbled through the neighborhood. Some of our fathers could not feed their family. We did not aspire to be like them. Though many of our parents studied the Quran, at home or under the tutelage of a neighbor or a makeshift mandrasa, some of them never set foot in a European style school, but they insisted that we did. The police chief and all his deputies were corrupt and sometimes cruel to our mothers at the marketplace. Those with power are prone to abuse it. This may just be human nature. The two churches with lavish compounds had two white men for priests. We hardly saw them outside of those compounds. A white person or two will appear on a market day. We thought they were peculiar, especially when they put peanut butter in their baguette and ate it. Sight is about contrast. You cannot see an object if there is nothing to contrast it against. Reality works in the same way. When I first got to America, I did not see me any differently. 
I saw many new things, including more white people than I knew existed, but that was just an observation, like seeing a penguin for the first time. What I needed, what will come later, was sort of an out-of-body experience to not only see my surroundings, but to see me in them. I could not see how I looked next to white, indeed among whites. More importantly, I could not imagine how these people may be seeing me. Needless to say, when racism snarled its teeth, I smiled back. I uh, don't know, maybe I got a couple of seconds. What, what I would like, the thing that surprised me about after I've been in America uh, a long time, it's, and then, may, uh, actually, more specifically, after I'd been in St. Cloud, Minnesota for a long time, it almost, and I think that's why over a while America does, it seeps to you, seeps in you when you're a black person to a point where you may not even uh, realize what it's doing to you. It was not, so after I've been in St. Cloud State for a while, um, went to Detroit. And I just remember get, being blown away how I felt about being in a city that was as black as Detroit was, and I think still is. I didn't know, this was not something I thought, that lack of blackness, being in St. Cloud at that time, I'd been in St. Cloud, I believe two or three years. And uh, I didn't realize the impact of that on me until I got placed uh, in a place like Detroit. And it's a feeling I get every time I'm in a city that's uh, predominantly black, obviously when I go home and when I've been in, uh, in the Caribbean. And I feel like uh, that's what being black in America sometimes is those little things that you don't even realize happens to you, that happens to you psychologically at a very deeper level. And uh, that's unfortunate because after all these years, there shouldn't be any white spaces in America. But unfortunately there is. I'll just leave it to that and, um, and invite my dear sister and friend, uh, Shannon Gibney. Thank you, eBay. Always giving us so much to uh, think about and turn over in our minds and hearts. Um, I'm actually going to read um, from an essay, a different essay. My essay in A Good Time for the Truth is called um, Fear of a Black Mother. And I wrote it about um, the fear that all black mothers uh, live with in this country, the fear that all black mothers have always lived with in this country, um, that our, our children, um, particularly in many ways, our, our sons will be targeted by law enforcement and by extrajudicial killings. Um, and what that does to us um, and our relationships with our children and the experience of motherhood in general. Um, and it was quite an honor to um, delve into that, that topic um, so I really, uh, I thank Sun Young for um, asking me to write on Black motherhood. That was not a topic at that time that I had really written a lot about. Um, so um, I'm going to dive into my essay. This um, essay I wrote um, shortly after George Floyd was murdered about 13 blocks um, from my house. It's called All the Stars of Flame. I always go back to Baldwin. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it so profoundly attacks one's sense of one's own reality. While the black man is functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, as an immovable pillar, 
and as he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken to their foundation. This quote is from The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin's seminal collection of essays on race, power, and politics. It was published in 1962, but might as well have been written yesterday. Baldwin's prescient observations about the psychology of American racism have always felt like a revelation to me. A voice from the grave whispering earth shattering truths in my ear that should have been obvious. Even after 60 years, Baldwin's words still managed somehow to occupy the present tense. To have effectively described the roots of white denial and disbelief that not only black people, but much of the nation, including black, brown, indigenous, and even some white folks are just done with the American police state and its relentless destruction of black, black bodies. That is something else. That is divination. The white hand ringing, what can we do? The images circulating everywhere, more popping up every day, fresh evidence of police abuse against protesters, the growing number of injured or even killed, the carnage of burning buildings and broken windows, and the reliable echoes of that ever loved rhetorical question. But why would they bring such destruction to their own communities? The reclamation of the bad apple argument, the violent white nationalists who always managed to be both well organized and a complete shock to their fellow white folks sense of reality, infiltrating protests and communities in Minneapolis and beyond, holding rallies in our parks and attempting to burn down libraries and minority owned businesses. Our political leadership's profound inability to understand the violence that is unfolding that has always been with us, but which hasn't had a wellspring big enough from which to burst up till now. Their shock at watching civil society collapse so quickly, the disbelief that this is happening on top of another crisis, COVID-19, the insistence that this virus is more deadly than racism, so protest is a public health hazard, the many past failed attempts at reforming the seemingly intractable police state, the chanting growing louder and louder, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. All of these are Baldwin's stars of flame. Jamar Clark, Philando Castile, George Floyd, all those ghosts, all those black bodies that were heretofore immovable pillars are now on the move. They walk among us and we among them. The living merging with the dead. They will have their day. They will be heard. And their voices are what is shaking heaven and earth to their foundation. Thank you so much. And I'm now going to turn it over to Carolyn Holbrook, I believe. I hope I am correct in the order. <laughs> Thing is David. Is it David? I'm so sorry. I knew I was gonna f mess that up. Um, my dear friend, um, and um, who, all the essays in the book are so beautiful. Um, but I deeply appreciated the historical, um, the historical grounding that David Lawrence Grants gives us through his masterful essay in the collection. Thank you, David. Let me unmute my microphone now. So, can you all hear me? Good. All right. Um, thank you, Shannon, and, and uh, thanks to my wonderful colleagues who were on before me. Um, you know, I, I've been going through a really interesting and very intense time these last few weeks. People who know me well know that um, Years ago now, uh, my family and I plugged into the, the whole DNA genealogy phenomenon, and I got very lucky uh, almost right away and found and reconnected with a group of kin in Ghana uh, who were part of the remnants of our family uh, left behind when uh, members of, of their immediate family were kidnapped and brought to America as enslaved people. And um, since then, 
in the years since then, we have encountered additional relatives from Ghana, from uh, Senegal, from Nigeria, from both Congos, and uh, most recently from a very surprising place in the southeast corner of the continent, Botswana. Um, so, you know, our, our heads are reeling and, and we're having an amazing experience reuniting with uh, our long missing African kin. But along the way, we have encountered literally hundreds of white cousins related to us, uh, obviously because ancestors of theirs once owned ancestors of ours. And um, if any of you saw the uh, brilliant essay that uh, got circulated online a lot last month by um, Carolyn Randall Williams, My Body is a Confederate Monument. Um, you know, your words tonight, Tyon, may, really made me think about that. Because um, that's true for probably a majority of us uh, who are descendants of America's enslaved. This um, really difficult and gut-wrenching reality that we have to deal with, which is that uh, we are also the descendants of a great many slave owners. And um, so one of the um, hallmarks of, of you know, what we like to call the difficult conversations uh, that black and white and other people of color need to have with um, uh, each other um, is even more complicated in our community, in the African-American community, uh, where we are, are faced with, with that reality all the time. And it just makes an already difficult conversation and reaching across that gulf to each other uh, even more fraught and more difficult. Um, you know, I, I have had conversations with white cousins who are quite um, far right on the political spectrum, but who bless them are still very interested in engaging and having some of those difficult conversations. And just the other night, uh, I was on the line with one of these cousins from Texas uh, who was saying, you know, um, I, I just got to say that it kind of uh, irks me how I see all you uh, people of color on the left uh, trying to uh, rewrite American history. And um, I had to stop him in his tracks and tell him, uh, no, Randall, here's the issue the way we see it. We <laughs> are trying to dig out from under the burden uh, of all the revisionist history that we were taught. And that includes you, Randall, uh, in, in middle school and in high school. So much of what you were taught is complete bunk. And uh, so one of, one of the things that makes the difficult conversations even more difficult is that as a wise person once said, you know, we're, we're all entitled to our own opinion about lots and lots of different things, but we are not all entitled to our, our own separate set of facts. And um, so a big part of the struggle that I think we are um, all dealing with, those of us who are engaged in what we're calling these difficult conversations, uh, run up against all the time is that there is a pitiful, really shocking lack of basic knowledge about the realities of um, uh, what our history involves, our shared history in this country. And um, so that's a, a huge piece of, of what I'm involved in these days. And I'm uh, in the middle of writing a, an essay, which um, may find its way into a book, but for sure, um, I'm first going to put it out there into the world as a piece on um, medium about uh, my father's bitter experience in Italy toward the end of World War II. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a good lesson in point about um, how sick it is that throughout its history, America has tried to imagine itself somehow as a white country. Uh, when it's obvious, you take a, a, even a, a cursory look around uh, and you can see there are lots and lots of other people who are not only here, but have been here since long before there was any such thing as the United States of America. And yet, uh, our imagining of ourselves as a white country before the world led to uh, the 
incredible situation that I discuss in this uh, short story, which um, I, I hope you'll all get a chance to read soon about um, how my father's unit uh, in uh, the hills of Tuscany was surrounded one night by, on three sides by um, German infantry with uh, light artillery. And uh, my father's unit, uh, they were in a desperate place. And so they called in an artillery strike and um, the young officer who responded after a long wait on the walkie talkie said, um, hell no, we ain't wasting good ammo on a bunch of damn niggers. And uh, so my father and his um, company uh, of men boxed in on three sides by uh, German fire, had to really um, have a moment of truth with themselves that night. Uh, the guy who was sort of the, the class clown of their platoon had been shot and was bleeding out and everybody knew it, he knew it. He's still lying there trying to crack jokes and uh, make everybody uh, lighten their mood a little. And, uh, you know, even as he's dying and the men in my father's unit are looking at each other and looking deep within and thinking, wait a minute, who exactly is the enemy here? Who, who are we here to fight? Whose flag are we fighting under, you know? So they come into town the next day, this little Italian town just down the road uh, from where they had managed to uh, hold out and survive the night, even though five of the 19 of them had died during the night. So they come down with these men wrapped in blankets. And um, uh, one of the kids ran up and said, oh, everybody's gonna be excited to see you because they've prepared a parade. Everybody's heard that the Americans are coming. So my father and his unit get to town and there are three Jeeps and uh, they're flying American flags. And um, they're met with utter shock and confusion and silence because just like in the Civil War, uh, black soldiers had to fight in all segregated, all black units, but with white officers. Um, and uh, there were no white officers with uh, his platoon. So it's all black soldiers and the Italians were confused. Well, who are these guys? They, you know, we were told the Americans were coming, but these can't be the Americans because it didn't occur to them that American soldiers would be anything other than white. So, um, you know, finally the, the word came down the line that, oh, oh there's, a, there's a couple of companies of um, uh, troops from the 91st who are coming through and, um, uh, you know, so why don't you guys sit and wait for them? And uh, one of the men in my father's unit said, no, let's just go take care of our dead and go to wherever our next bivouac is supposed to be. And my father said, hell no, I, I love a parade, don't you? Besides, I wanna see these Americans when they come through. So they sat and they waited and sure enough, the people who had been, you know, the pretty girl with the uh, sash on and the flowers to, to give to the commanding officer, stepped forward, did her duty, the band played, they handed out food um, and, uh, you know, just sit with that for a minute and think about how you would have felt if you were one of those black soldiers in that little town that day. Um, so, you know, having these conversations requires telling stories like the one that I just told you a very brief version of, right? Um, it's a way to break the ice and it's a way to uh, make somebody who might be very disinclined to listen to what you have to say, uh, sit back and say, well, okay, um, I got to admit what you just told me did move me at least some and it's surprising to me and it is, I have to admit, shocking to me as an American. So what else have you got to say? And um, I want to read a, a passage from the uh, essay that I wrote for this book, People Like Us, uh, that talks about exactly that, how hard starting a conversation can be when you know that it might take you to territory that um, you're kind of scared to venture into. So it's a, a story about um, my having wandered into a shop uh, that no longer exists. It's a bike shop now, but uh, back when I 
um, was living in that corner of the neighborhood. Uh, it was a car repair shop run by an older uh, Norwegian American named Bud. And um, I, uh, even though I had heard the guy is a terrible racist and no, you don't want to do business with him, um, I just had a gut feeling that that probably wasn't true. Um, and uh, that he was probably just a, a, a crotchety old bastard. And as I say earlier in this essay, now that I write from the point of view of somebody who's become a, a crotchety old bastard himself, um, I, I'm 100% sure that I'm right about him in retrospect now. Um, so I'll just pick up right in the middle of a sentence. He shot me a searing look of pity mixed with disgust and said simply, a man ought never pay another man to do something he could do for himself. Well, this pronouncement felt stunningly sharp and severe especially coming from the mouth of someone who did, after all, make his living from doing the repairs that his customers didn't care to do. His words made me wonder what he must think of most of us men walking around his rapidly changing neighborhood, black and brown men, none of whom had come up as he did on a hard scrabble farm established by Norwegian immigrant grandparents who made the clothes they wore and who ate almost entirely only the food they grew themselves people for whom life was hard, but who never complained. I thought about us black men from the neighborhood who walk around looking sullen and sad and how men like Bud must look at us and wonder why. They don't see much, if any, evidence of the discrimination that keeps us angry and on edge. They certainly don't see how they've ever personally been guilty of committing an act of discrimination against us or anyone else. So we don't get each other. They don't see, um, they don't tend to understand much about how the world looks to us and we don't tend to understand much about how the world looks to them. So even though some of the time we share the same space, we avoid talking and when we must, we keep it superficial, allowing ourselves to come tantalizingly close for an instant, but then spiraling past each other like separate galaxies, each on its own axis into the void. As Bud's words sank in, I turned to leave, but then suddenly, Something in me wouldn't let me leave on that note. I felt the need to challenge him, surprise him through a small spontaneous gesture aimed at bridging that yawning silent gulf between us if only for a moment. Okay then, I said, want to take a minute or two and show me how to do it myself? Without needing even a moment to think about it, he surprised me by pulling out the tools in that need and agreeably talking me through the job while he sipped strong coffee and went back to working on the car he'd been fixing when I walked in. As we worked side by side in his tiny shop, I eased into a story about my own people, how generations of my folks struggled, always managing to creatively make a way from no way. He didn't say much, but he was listening. My attempt to paint as vivid a picture for him as I could of the people I come from, people who also took what life threw their way and didn't complain, seemed to resonate with him. Mid-job, I noticed there was a sign on the wall stating that it was illegal for customers to be back there in the shop, and he'd, he'd apparently decided to ignore in my case. So even though he, he stepped in to help me replace and tighten the belts, he also decided to completely ignore the sign that said, shop charge $45 an hour. Because when I pulled out my checkbook to pay for the parts and asked him why I shouldn't pay at least enough to split the difference on time with him, he said, well, why? Done it yourself, didn't you? So see, Minnesota nice can be really nice, interesting and complicated too. Bridging the gulf between us is hard. It takes courage and effort, but the effort often results in an encounter that can be both unrewarding and unpleasant. But what alternative do we have? I'm gonna put it down in quick reading right there. Um, I really, I think uh, the, the remaining things I would like to say to y'all, I will say when we do our uh, summation at the end. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton on to my dear friend, Carolyn Holbrook. Uh, we've known each other for, God, at least 30 years, something like that, Carolyn. Um, and there's something really, really special about um, those long-term relationships, the old relationships. 
Um, I appreciate them. The longer I live, the more I appreciate those those long uh, lifelong relationships. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to pass the baton on to you and, and let you share uh, the, the beauty and the lyricism of, of your words with these folks too. Well, thanks David for that lovely introduction. And thank you um, friends of the library and for, you know, for bringing us in tonight to celebrate this wonderful book. Um, my story in the book is titled, Say What? And it's on page 99. It's about voice and how we are so often asked to negate our identity, to give up our voices. But what's on my heart tonight is something different. I'm concerned about black women and girls. As so many of the panelists pointed out, the blatant murder of George Floyd woke the world up to something that we black folks have known for over 400 years, that our people are subjected to lethal force in alarming numbers, and COVID has brought racial disparities to the fore like never before. Yet until recently, the murders and disappearances of black women and girls have been all but ignored. I have three daughters, five granddaughters, and I worry about them as much as I worry about my two sons and my three grandsons. All of our lives are in danger every day, the boys and the girls. Hashtag say her name puts a spotlight on the dangers that black girls and women face and have been facing since the first slave ship landed in 1619. Our voices have been stolen in many ways. We've been raped, we've been murdered physically, emotionally, and psychically, and I want it to stop. So instead of reading my piece that's in A Good Time for the Truth, I'm just gonna read a tiny little excerpt from one of the essays in my book. Um, this essay is, is titled Stones and Sticks. It's an obvious play on sticks and stones, blah, blah, blah. So um, I wrote this piece following a video poetry class that I took back in the 80s before video poetry became so popular. And I was in a very small class and this young white woman who I call Gretel in the story wanted to, um, she wanted to video a poem that she had written about roller skating through a graveyard. And, you know, I felt kind of off about it, but I decided I'll just go along with it. And so we went to um, Lakewood Cemetery in uptown Minneapolis. And here she is skating through this graveyard and the other class members were following her. And finally she stopped. And I saw this old weather beaten statue that was tarnished with green and black stains. And, you know, it was just sort of, okay. So the, the girl looked up at the rest of the class with this stupid little grin on her face. And she said, it's a statue of a black woman. If you touch her, you die. Of course, I was the only one in the group who heard it like she did. Uh, excuse me, who heard it like I did. Um, and I'm just gonna read you a few paragraphs from that essay. I was paralyzed, unable to respond. My breath halted as though a knife had been jabbed in my chest and slowly twisted into my heart. I took another look at the woman locked in that dark body made of granite. And in my mind's eye, her shoulders began to slump from carrying the weight of all that stone. She seemed to crumble under the burden of overwork and underappreciation from cooking and cleaning for the families of Gretel's ancestors while desperately trying to care for her own family, the families of my ancestors. At that moment, I remembered every negative image I ever heard of black women, oversexed, breeder, wet nurse, mammy, hostile nappy-headed hoe. Gretel's words named something I had felt vaguely all my life, but had not been able to describe with words of my own. I have three beautiful, intelligent daughters, and I've had to help them maintain their self-images over and over again, even as I've attempted to heal my own. I also fully understand the horror of what is happening to our young men. I have a son who was incarcerated for 10 years in the federal penitentiary. But there seemed to be a conspiracy of silence around our girls and women. Could it be that in large part our incarceration is invisible? That we are locked up in our bodies? I left the cemetery wondering what it would take to liberate us. 
Today, I watch my grandchildren move through a world where the current president has given the green light to white supremacy following President, o president Obama's eight years of hope and where once again, black and brown bodies are under violent attack. And I have to ask, what is it that will set us free? And I'll just stop there so we can move into the discussion. Thank you all so, so very much for these powerful words and thoughts. And I really, I'm sitting over here in, in my own space thinking that I want to take a whole bunch of time to process all of this, but we have a lot of viewers in other rooms and I know that um, from the questions that we've received, they're very anxious to hear you speak some more. And um, in the questions that we've had, there's a lot of resonance around this idea of what is happening right now and what has happened since this book was published. And I'm wondering if you can all respond in however way you would like to a question. Um, I think Emily in St. Paul puts this best and she's wondering what, if anything, has changed in Minnesota regarding truth telling by black, indigenous and people of color and this idea of reconciliation in our state. And, and if you have any thoughts on on if there's been movement in the last four years since this anthology was published. Um, I think just to make it a little bit easy, if you don't mind, Andrea, since you went first, I'll put you on the spot um, to start. No, I certainly don't mind, uh, Elaine. And I'm just, again, just blown away by all of the, the words and the, the lyrical, joy um, and pain that has been expressed tonight. Um, so thank you all. Um, yeah, we, we're in a moment. And, and you know, I think I, I said at the top, it, it really is, I, I think, quite an honor when, when your work can be revived to speak to a particular moment. Um, and um, I think this book, certainly certainly does that and and right now we we know that much has changed since this book was published and much has remained the same um you know just in terms of from from a purely city political perspective you know and, and, and thinking about the issues that we're grappling with around um, public safety and police accountability, et cetera, et cetera. Like we have a new police chief, a, a black police chief, the first black police chief in, in Minneapolis history, uh, a, a very honorable man, a very uh, competent man. Um, and he is not able to, to really change the, the culture of white supremacy that is so um, deeply embedded into um, our police culture. Um, you know, the, the city council has created, um, you know, a racial equity action plan. Uh, we passed the 2040, uh, plan which was designed to to redress the the ills and the challenges um, that have been um, perpetrated against African Americans. Things that I talk about in my essay, um, and and I hope people reread that. Um, but you know, a lot a lot has changed, and 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 again, nothing has changed. Um, when, when I wrote that essay, we were coming up to the end of, um, of the uh, Obama presidency and, um, and just beginning this um, campaign that has, has brought us uh, the current occupant of the White House. And um, 
it rolled back a lot of the progress that has that had been been made. Um, but again, I think the challenge for us all is we we really need. I mean, this cannot be um, a people of color issue, a black people's issue. This has to be all of our issue, and we need white people to step up and be a part of the change. That is plain and simple what, what needs to happen. Um, the resistance is what keeps us perpetually um, sort of um, in, this, in this loop of uh, putting Band-Aids and, and um, you know, sort of performance type of um, solutions um, and, and, and nothing really, really changes. So uh, we, we need everybody to be a part of the solution. And, and maybe, just maybe, um, we are moving into that phase now. Mm -hmm. Are there others of you who'd like to chime in on that or, or echo it? I thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that that perspective. Um, one thing I guess I would like to say is um, for being yesterday, I was part of a um, Zoom meeting featuring uh, an activist uh, in Sierra Leone just talking about what happened, uh, the work he's done there after the civil war that happened in Sierra Leone, the truth and reconciliation that happened there. And the linkage I guess I can do to that is that reconciliation doesn't happen until people are first willing to accept that a wrong was done, that there is indeed a problem. And I feel like for a very long time, and maybe even still to a degree, we'll see, time will tell, right? Hopefully this outrage, national outrage we have is not justified. But for the longest time, Americans have been in denial of, its, of her sins and the existence that is still uh, that a good uh, number of her citizens still suffer uh, the consequence of that sin. So reconciliation is kind of hard to start until you first accept that there's a problem from which we have to come back. So um, the George Floyd killing has awakened the country to that. I uh, feel like for the, until then, the burden of proof has been on the victim. So no matter uh, what happens, it was always that black people and people of color had to prove to the white people that in fact what we are feeling is real it's not just in our head but then we may 25th 2020 we have the nine minutes <laughs> i get proof right there for all to, for us all to see it and now all of a sudden people believe what black people have been saying perhaps ever since they've been in this country. If that means that's the beginning of that reconciliation, amen, it's about time. And I hope that we don't go back to the time of before. We don't run out of patience because this process is not a short thing. And we're not gonna wake up tomorrow and all the problems are solved. And if we wake up the day after it's not solved, we say, well, search and search. It's gonna take some time and this is a beginning. Yeah, I would um, add to that. I think um, nothing really has changed in so much as things have, in have intensified. Um, I would have never thought that um, our work is part of a movement where everybody's contributing in their own way and what they're doing in different mediums. But I think there are lines of demarcation that happen in history, right? The March on Washington, 
um, the assassination of Martin Luther King, right? We could go, go down that list. And the killing of George Floyd was such a mark, right? A, a line of demarcation that shifted the paradigm where like another layer was removed. I think I would say, I feel like we're on a precipice and um, people are deciding what side they're on. And to add to what my colleagues have said, because I agree wholeheartedly, there's a level of, of complicitness that we have had in this system, what Dr. Lawson calls a plantation system where the United States has maintained itself upon the exploitation of other people, right? By developing these stereotypes and identities that have maintained a way of life for certain people at the top, that is no longer sustainable, right? And COVID is an example of the, crumble, uh, the crumbling infrastructure that's showing that that, um, that lifestyle is not only hurting um, marginalized people, those people who are the most vulnerable, but I would argue it's gonna hurt everybody on the circle, even those who are privileged. And it's kind of scary to watch that there are people who are so invested in maintaining that false reality that they're willing to destroy a democracy republic in order to maintain that. So I think we're at the moment of intensity. More stories need to be told. More stories are being told. More people need to, to, to speak. And it will be up to us to decide, right, whether what, what we're going to do. It's exciting to see that people are saying, what, no more, right? People have gotten to the point where, you know, if you're going to kill me anyway, then I might as well stand up for myself and fight. I think the thing that I wonder about, and I have three children, is um, where will we go, right? Um, what will people choose? Um, will people continue to look or will they look away? And if they look and see, will they have the courage to go through the struggle that we'll have to go through in order to get to the other side to get to that uh, truth and reconciliation that eBay is talking about and have the courage to be willing to say, we don't know what it might look like, but it's gonna have to look different in order for it to be equitable for all people. Like, I think what we're imagining is a total transformation of the system that we live in. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And then the question is whether or not we're gonna be there. Um, and I think it's gonna happen whether we want it to or not. And the notion is whether it's going to be painful, <laughs> whether or not we're going to participate. And then those of us who I think get the honor and privilege to be in community and hopefully uh, leave the artifacts and maybe document in our own ways what those experiences are about. I hope that made, made sense. I think the question that was asked is a, is a brilliant question. Um, and, you know, who knows? Um, our great grandchildren will ask us what was this like? So, yeah, it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're you're absolutely right, Ty. Um, it it is it is it's happening. Um, sort of whether whether we like it or not. Um, you know, I I guess I don't know if we have to choose what side are we on, and 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 maybe we do. I I, I I'm just saying I don't know, but I I do know that it's only one planet. <laughs> So uh, we all got to live on it. And I, I, I think we all have to somehow figure out how do we get to enough of the same side <laughs> that we can all live on this planet together. Well, I was trying to be and, diplomatic, Andrea. I think you're right. Like there should only be one size, but a side. But I think that's part of our naivete that we don't want to acknowledge that there are people who actually think that there's an other choice. Like we know that that choice is killing us and killing them. Right. But I think part of our ability to fight, right, whatever that looks like, we have to be willing to accept the ugly for how ugly it is. You know how your mama used to tell you that, you know, you have the wrong friends that's going to kill you because you really you can't see how bad they are, right? Like I wrote a haiku mm -hmm. for Herman Cain. I, I, I say this with all due respect. My son asked me to write a haiku and I think the haiku was like, all along you should have known the folks weren't your friend. Damn. Damn. Dead, right? <laughs> Dead. And may he rest in peace, right? And that shouldn't have happened to him. It shouldn't happen to anybody. But this notion that if we're naive and we don't see that other choice for what it is, how do we then start to fight? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, those people are there and I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to get them to the side of right, the side of equality. Um, but, but, but we all got to live here, you know, for the time period. And so we keep pushing and maybe, maybe we can get to that. Again, I am not suggesting that I know 
the answer, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm really, I think being vulnerable and saying, I don't know, but. Yeah, and, yeah, and I don't um, know either, but we write, right? And we love. Yes. And we do what's right in the moment that exists and when, when we're called to, right? I think sometimes that's all we can do. I hope that doesn't sound like a cop out, right? Yeah, no, Shannon, what are, what are you thinking? Andrea calling me out. <laughs> yeah, just a little. <laughs> you know, um, and I just have to say, um, uh, it's just so moving to me to see, um, you know, you, Andrea, like here you are, this amazing artist, this amazing human being, but you're also a politician, right? Like you, you, you're fusing these uh, these two worlds, and so, um, and I know I, I know that I don't know so many of the the struggles and the conversations and and um, so much that that you're kind of holding. Um, but I just I I just appreciate your voice. I appreciate the voice of um, all my colleagues. I I do feel like it's as. Uh, <laughs> Kamala Harris said, you know, in her speech last night, it's an inflection point. We are at an inflection point right now, um, nationally, locally. Um, globally. Globally, right. Very much so. uh, it's that's yeah. a period of, you know, um, yeah. Are we going to survive or are we gonna perish? You know, I mean, that's really where we're headed. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I don't, I mean, for example, this whole movement towards defunding the police, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people, myself included, I'm just being honest, like don't know what that looks like or what that really means. And, and a lot of people, um, you know, we're scared of what we don't, what we don't know. Um, and so I think that there's um, just like a lot of, um, uh, as Ty said, storytelling, um, a lot of listening, a lot of um, hearing from voices that we really uh, have not heard from or centered um, in the past um, and in the present, um, which is why I think that that forums like this are so critical and, and books like um, uh, this one are, are so critical as well, because they do that work. Um, because part of the problem is we don't know what we don't know, <laughs> you know? Um, and so as Andrea is saying, you know, sort of like that work of being vulnerable, like none of us know what this is gonna look, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to still then show up in mm -hmm. all our brokenness. Right. We have to do the work messiness. anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. the work is doing us. So we might as well, you know, David, go ahead. Love to hear from you. Uh, not much to add other than that. Um, yeah, it is an inflection point that, that we're at, no doubt. I mean, I, I don't remember who said it, but some wise person said, yeah, you know, history may not literally repeat itself, but it rhymes. <laughs> and uh, the moment that this rhymes with right now to me, uh, if you read um, Ta-Nehisi Coates's brilliant book, uh, We Were Eight Years in Power, mm -hmm. he lays it out very clearly. You know, this is very reminiscent. Uh, uh, the, the eight years of the Obama presidency are very reminiscent of those eight years of reconstruction. Yep. And uh, there was so much resistance from uh, so many people in America to doing the right thing and to moving forward. Okay. And uh, you know, we, we had a, a, a president, uh, President Lincoln, when he gave uh, his second inaugural address, talking to the country about forgiveness and about uh, seeking communion with our better angels and moving forward into the America that he believed the founding uh, fathers and mothers always meant it to be. But he realized to his great sorrow, and I, I, we're still in denial about it now, that we live in a country that has somehow never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity to address these fundamental problems that came from our founding. Right, the, those those sins that were there in the cradle, right, of of the theft of, of of all this native land by this settler culture, and then the enslavement of millions of of Africans, right, 
uh, it, it just it, it has never been addressed, even though attempts have been made. And what has happened every time America has stepped up to bat and deal with uh, this legacy, um, then it's been compromised away. It's been compromised away over and over again with slave owners. And even though slavery may be dead and gone, it is living a very vibrant and active afterlife in America 2020. And we see it everywhere in the, 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 the inequalities that exist in, in healthcare and in education and access to every good thing of life that uh, Native Indigenous people and Brown people and Black people have been struggling to achieve equality in since the get-go. And so it's time for Americans of goodwill of every color to step up and say, I'm not doing this in order to make life better for black and brown people because I feel badly for them. I'm doing it because I want to leave a better America for my children and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren to live in. It's such a no brainer, right? This is, <laughs> you know, this is everybody's fight. This is everybody's struggle. And we need not to compromise, we need not to waste this moment that we're in right now. We need not to waste it and go back to our sad, sorry old ways, once again, of not fully stepping up to the bat and, and not doing what the moment requires of us to do. And yeah, it, it, just like Shannon was saying, of course this is scary, right? Because we don't know exactly how this is gonna go, but some indigenous person gave this saying to us and it's beautiful. Sometimes you, you just gotta make the road by walking, right? And I think, that's a hallmark of this moment too. We just have to trust in ourselves, look around, trust in each other. Just like they tell you in church, right? You get up at the end of service and say, all right, everybody look around, give that person next to you a hug. Seek out somebody you don't know, <laughs> right? And give them a hug. Well, that's not a lightweight superficial thing really at all, ever. Because what it's doing is, is, is asking people to, all right, Dig deep, let's get real now. Look at that person next to you and recognize the fact that we are in communication. We are in community with each other. We gotta own that, we gotta embrace it and walk out into that new day with a sense of, of hopefulness and direction because we have the intention, a genuine intention that's heartfelt to make sure that our children and grandchildren see a better day. And that's something that regardless of where we are in the political spectrum, we can recognize is in everybody's self-interest and best interest, right? It's in our collective interest to seek each other out and start walking this road. David, that's, um, that is a really incredible. Thank you. I want to give Carolyn, um, you were our last presenter and I want to give you a moment here to to respond as you would like, if you would like, um, to end our evening. Um, so if you'd like. Well, just following what everyone else is saying, um, you know, I think we also cannot forget that with 401 years of oppression behind us, it's, it's gonna be hard for us to break out of the mindset that's caused by post-traumatic slave syndrome. I don't know if you guys have seen that book. It's yeah, it's real. And the past is down of pain from one generation to the next generation and on and on and on. It's going to take a lot for us to stop colonizing our each other, you know, because we're so familiar with the colonization mindset. Um, we have an opportunity for real change now, um, but it's just really important for us to know that it's not going to be easy. And yeah, I mean, I love what David was saying, and it's, it's just so right on and so true. And we just have to be real. And eBay, you said this is a good start. Sweetheart, we got to stop starting and keep moving. We've started, <laughs> how many times have we started? You know? Yeah. Thank you, Caroline. You're right. <laughs> yeah, amen. Let's hope this time there's another, there is no other start after this, right? Let's hope this is the last one. 
Yeah, well, we can't. I mean, th we we can't stop now. There's no, we just, we can't. This is too big. You know, it's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would just like to say on behalf of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library that, that we couldn't be in this moment with a better, a more amazing and awe-inspiring group of writers than you. I can't thank you enough um, for being a part of this program tonight and for the work that you've created and will continue to create. Thank you so much, Sun Young Shin, Tyon Coleman, Shannon Gibney, David Lawrence Grant, Carolyn Holbrook, eBay, and Andrea Jenkins. Uh, it really has been such a privilege to hear your stories, um, your very, very powerful stories tonight. And um, I find myself really inspired, even though it is a lot of work and we know it's gonna be a lot of work, I hope that we can be a part of, um, of being that change by listening to your stories and more of them. Again, to everyone here tonight, thank you so very much. You can still purchase, please, at any point in time, you can purchase a copy of A Good Time for the Truth Race in Minnesota. The ebook is available through Sunday night and on behalf, again, of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library as the Minnesota Center for the Book and State Library Services, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for being such a thoughtful audience. And we'd also like to thank our program partners. Um, there is so much to think about. Um, I'm immensely grateful again and inspired. And I hope that that is true for the whole audience. Thank you again for being part of One Book, One Minnesota and good night. Shout out to Sun Young Shen. Yep, thank you Sun Young. Sun Young is yeah. Let's go do the work. The visionary who made it happen. Yes. Absolutely. Love you too. Peace out, John. Peace out. Everybody be safe oh, and well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Love to everybody. Bye. Bye.